Today, I'm excited to share with you seven more setups you can do with just four subwoofers. I have a previous video on the channel called Four Subwoofers, Seven Setups, Ground Stacked Edition, in which I showed you seven different ways you can manipulate four subs to get great results on your shows. This is all up to the show's scope, where you can put subs, where's the stage, the aesthetic, the SPL requirements, how much low end rejection you need on stage, can you fly them? All of these factors tell us how we can deploy subs to get the best results. And so if any one of these changes, you now have seven additional ways you can reach in your bag and get amazing low end on your shows. So the seven we're gonna walk through today is a tight line of subwoofers. We're gonna be doing a physical arc, a delayed arc, a four element end fire, set up. We're going to be doing a gradient squared array, a flown vertical stack, and a blend of regular and infra subwoofers. So super pumped to share all these with you today. The criteria we're going to be looking at is the coverage over frequency. Does it widen, narrow, or stay the same? Are these subwoofers efficient? So do we lose energy from them being apart, or do we get a lot of coupling because they're close together? Third is going to be stage leakage. There's a lot of energy coming on the stage, or is this a cardioid array where we get some rejection and keep it cleaner. The number of output channels are going to be needing to deploy this array. So this isn't the number of physical outputs you need. We have four subs, but the amount of processing channels that are separate from each other to get the result that you need. Lastly is the IR integrity, the impulse response. Is it going to stay nice and tight, aka things are all lining up and hitting at the same time, or we have different arrivals over our audience from subs being spaced further apart. Is it going to feel a little bit looser? All right, so let's jump into our first array. First up, we've got the tight line. It narrows over frequency. It's very efficient since they're all close together. We have lots of stage leakage since we don't have a cardioid setup and it's very close to the stage. It can be driven on just a single output channel. You could daisy chain between subs, but they're just driven from the same signal. It has very tight IR since they're close together and we have close arrival times. So let's look at the coverage. So we're gonna do this for every array. We're gonna start at 31 hertz, move up an octave to 63, then up another octave to 125. So we're basically omnidirectional at 31, a slight narrowing. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna see this narrow over frequency, and why is that? A good rule of thumb to know is that any line source, whether it's a line array or a line of subs, the frequency that is equal in wavelength to that array or that line, that line source is gonna be at 72 degrees. If we get longer than that, we're going to get uh, a narrower, narrowing of frequency, and if we're shorter than that, it's gonna widen out. So if we're looking at 31 hertz, that's about 36 feet or 12 meters. That is, this line is a little over eight feet, so we're definitely shorter than that. So we're gonna be omni. But if we double in frequency, 63 hertz is a lot closer to what's 36 divided by 218. We're still shorter than that, but we've got some narrowing here. But then here we're at 125, that's really close <laughs> to about nine feet, which is a quarter wavelength of that. So we are almost equal here. So here from this array, we see it narrowing in frequency in about a 72 degree angle coming off of this. And we've moved farther up in frequency, it would get even narrower. Let's move on to our next array, the physical arc. So a sub arc attempts to take this narrowing pattern we experience we're having a long line of subs. Maybe we just need a huge amount of subwoofers for a big field and all we can do is line them up across the stage. If we did that and didn't apply any processing, it would just narrow into this triangle of death pummeling down the center, which we don't want because that's where all those subs are overlapping. So by applying a physical arc, we can start to spread out this energy. It's recommended by a lot of industry experts to do at least six subwoofers in this array. Eight is optimal. So I use Merlin Van Veen's subarray designer uh, spreadsheet or ca calculator. I'll link to that below. And this is what I came up with for optimizing a four single 18 subarray with a crossover at 100 hertz. What it has you do or I think is logic in starting it, is you go a third of an octave above the crossover frequency, and then you can space them a half wavelength apart, and then you use delay, or uh, you move them forward to kind of create uh, the coverage shape you're after. In this case, I, I went for 90 degrees to cover the audience. Anyway, I'm gonna cover all that in a later video. We won't get too nitty gritty today, but that's what's happening with the physical arc, why we arc it to spread out the energy so we don't get this triangle of death down the middle. 
So the physical arc is going to narrow over frequency. It's going to be lower efficiency since we're spreading out elements so they're not coupling together. We have lots of stage leakage still. There's no cardioid element to this. This physical arc can be driven from a single output channel since we're getting the actual manipulation of the wavefront by their physical displacement from each other. It's going to have a looser IR when compared to something that's close together since we're spaced out in different arrival times. So let's look at it at 31 hertz. It's a little bit narrower than we saw with just the straight line. Since they are farther apart, we're going to get some narrowing. And then now at 63 hertz, this is very similar to what it looks like at 125 with the tight line. This is still a little bit narrower, but just by moving our elements apart and applying this arc, we can see that an octave lower than originally, we're able to narrow that pattern. So this room shape is not a perfect fit for this particular setup, but just know that you can get some mileage by narrowing things by using a physical arc just with four setups and then we see things start to get really weird once we get above 100 hertz and this is 125 hertz it starts to look like this fighter plane and we get more of this nose down the middle here moving on to our next area we have the delayed arc so this one is the same as the physical arc but instead of moving these two cabinets forward we're actually going to apply delay to the outer cabinets to virtually push them out. So this is also going to narrow over frequency, albeit less than the physical arc, as lower efficiency since we're spreading them out. Still gonna have lots of stage leakage, no cardioid element. We need two output channels minimum. So we need to drive the inner pair of subs and then the outer pair will be driven together and we'll be adding delay to the outer one. So this is a delayed arc at 31 hertz, still a little bit of narrowing compared to the straight line. And 63 hertz is pretty cool. It, it's it's a lot of energy coming back on stage, but we don't have a weird lobing in the pattern. It's, it's narrowing it further still. And not quite as a weird of a fighter jet pattern here at 125. So with delayed arcs, I usually like subwoofers uh, that have lower crossover points because things start to get weird in the upper frequencies. Now let's move on to our first flown setup. This is a flown four element and fire array. We could just as well do one on the ground, but these are hard to pull off if you just have four subwoofers with a wide stage because you don't have real estate to do it in front of the stage, you're doing it on the side of it. So I decided to get this one up in the air to show you what it'll look like. We still can do it center. So it's still gonna narrow over frequency as we move up. It's the most efficient of the cardioid arrays because what's happening with the end fire array is we're saying, fourth sub fire third fire second and then the front we're having this one wait for all these three to arrive so we're applying successively more amounts of delay as we go forward in the array to have them wait where they all line up right here and then, then they couple and move forward out into the audience. And what's happening then is at the rear of the array, so the, the red trace is in front, we're getting comb filtering in the back due to now the staggered arrival times in the rear. <laughs> so it's business in the front, party in the back, no mullet required. So that's what's happening. So it's not broadband rejection, but we get this uh, notched rear rejection, which I mentioned over here, but the pro is be, it's very efficient. So if you're worried about having enough headroom, this is gonna get you the most level out of the four setups that are gonna be cardioid. You need four output channels. So you need to be able to drive each of these four subs separately, adding successive amounts of delay. These are spaced 1.27 meters, and then a, uh, another 1.27 and another 1.27, and then equal amounts delay to get them to line up at the front. This also has the tightest impulse response of the cardioid array since we're timing them to all arrive here at time zero or I guess summation point zero at the same time, then forward out to the audience. And we have the most staggered arrival times here at the back, creating the cancellations that you're seeing or the notches. So here's the flown four element and fire at 31 hertz. It's, it's, it's a pretty wide pattern, which you start to see. So the other ones we saw narrowing, and this starts wider than it is long. So I would say if I'm in a really wide audience, I would reach for this one. And then we're moving up to 63 hertz. It's getting even wider, and we're starting to see how at the rear, this 63 is actually right here. It's not in the middle of this comb, so we're not getting the maximum rejection. So if you know if your band plays in a certain key a lot, or there's a particular resonance that always happens on the floor tom or the kick drum, you can actually fine tune your 
uh, in uh, sorry in fire array to have the notch at that specific point so you can try it to eliminate feedback so it's another really nerdy thing you can do so that's 31 hertz 63 hertz and then 125 again we see this pattern weirdness again i think this one works better if you have crossover frequencies that are lower so you're not getting um, some of this weirdness up top but our fifth array here is the flown gradient squared array this one's super fun it's actually combining combining two different setups so in the previous video i did an inline gradient stack so that's having this top cabinet facing forward and this bottom cabinet facing rearward and what we're doing is then time aligning at let's say at this location the time arrival arrival of the front sub and the rear sub and we're having them line up here then applying a polarity inversion on the bottom one to get them to cancel and then the bottom sub is actually arriving a half wavelength late but polarity inverted therefore summing at the center frequency and creating some addition so we're only getting a 3 beat 3 db addition instead of a total 6 db addition but we're trading that for broadband cancellation in the back so this front pair of subs is its own element and this rear one is the same thing but now let's make it a two element and fire rate where this one's going here and we're waiting for that one to arrive and then it goes both together so we're combining two different cardioid uh, setups to be able to get even more rejection and the benefits of both so this widens over frequency instead of narrowing over frequency we get some efficiency loss because it is a inline gradient so it's only the 3 db possible summation out of six of two sources come together we get broadband rear, rear rejection which is different than our n fire array although this is a combination of in, in, inline gradient and and fire we need four output channels minimum for this each sub needs to get a different output channel it's going to be a little bit looser ir since these are inline gradient but the end fire um, is going to help things stay tight so it's kind of in the middle here so the flown gradient squared array here's 31 hertz now moving up to 63 hertz even more rejection back there and now 125 it's even wider and this is where things aren't quite as efficient here in the back but i think it's a really cool array you can have this left and right you can do this on the ground wherever you want to do but it's able to get a lot of rejection in the back so come here in the audience if we draw it up to this color this is our zero db point and here behind this stage is more than 30 db down which is crazy so i think it's a pretty cool set so this is for maximum rejection Moving on to number six, this is our flown vertical stack. So just like our first setup, the tight line, this is the same thing, except we've turned it 90 degrees and put it up in the air. So just like we had narrowing over frequency with that one, we have this one here, and we're able to narrow it in the vertical domain. So if we want a, we have a long, deep audience, we don't want this orb of energy pummeling the front, we can start to tighten it. So it's very efficient since they're all right together, just like the first one. It mitigates some leakage because we are narrowing the vertical beam. So it's not blobbing out coming on stage. It's able to stay tighter here as we go up in frequency. And it's a very tight impulse response since they're all coupled together arriving at the same time. And this is it from the side if we're looking at the response. This is a single subwoofer at 100 hertz. And then now we see how it's squashed down into a donut here if we add four elements. If we added even more subwoofers in a line, we would get the same thing. Now let's look at it at 31 hertz, mostly omnidirectional, 63 hertz, same thing. And then at 125, it's even more even. It's louder, but more of the audience is the same color when compared to these other ones since we have the steering of flattening this out. So we can see over frequency, if we get a higher trim height, more subs, we can get even lower in frequency, all to be at the same level. You can see this is only three colors, the dark red, uh, the normal red, and the orange. This one has four color changes, and it starts uh, earlier in the audience, and this one even more here at 31 hertz. So again, longer line length can help steer things really well. Here's our last one, getting real creative here. This is the infra plus regular sub. So let's look at to infra an infra trace and a regular trace from map 3d and infra as an infrared light is the opposite of ultraviolet ultraviolet is above what we can see infra is below so an infra sub is the sum of information below so this trace is an 1100 lfc the 
blue, and then the infra goes below that. So it's specifically tuned just to, to handle 31 hertz and below all the way down to 13 hertz, which is nuts. So, so think of this as a way and supplement and provide these ultra low frequencies. So this is still narrowing over frequency since we have varying wavelengths with them spaced apart, but I have the infras on the outside. I have them spaced a half wavelength apart at 31 hertz, which is about 18 feet or six meters. And that gets us some pattern narrowing so I don't have this omnidirectional blob of ultra low energy so that I can narrow it on the audience. Again, that's you may not always need that, but that's why I have them spaced apart. Then I have these two subs here in the middle who are now handling the octave above that right together so they're very efficient. And I'm trying the best I can to match that coverage pattern to the infra coverage pattern. They're very efficient since they're together. At least these metal subs, these might need a little bit more gas since they're spaced apart, but I'm sacrificing efficiency for getting my pattern to narrow. We need two processing channels minimum. I would drive the infras and the uh, regular subs separately. And it's still going to be a tight IR since we don't have you know a bunch of subs all arriving together. And these aren't overlapping in frequency range all that much. So this is going to arrive at it's it at it's given points throughout the audience and then the middle pair is going to arrive at different points. So let's look at 31 hertz. This is right where the subs are handing off to each other. That's where they cross over. Looking at this trace, here's 31. So it's just a little bit below that. And we see that pattern at 63 hertz. It actually is a little bit wider than it is deep because I have these subwoofers that they're pretty much sole custodians right there. But then I did not pull them farther apart because if I did, 125 hertz would get super narrow. So you kind of have to pick your battles and see like, well, I can keep the efficiency. I'm not going to get all frequencies to the exact pattern that I need. But just was an interesting use case to see how you can mix subwoofer types and attempt to get their coverage angles similar. So not perfect here, but with just four subwoofers, that's what we can do with them on the ground. So landing this plane, here's what I want you to take away. I hope this expands your sub toolbox. Now you have 14 different ways, including the other video I made for you to deploy your subs with just four enclosures. I think this gives you a lot of options to see how you can figure out uh, what's going on and assessing your show goals. I want you to know your trade-offs. So with each array, know these specific criterias uh, criterion criterias that we talk through the the coverage angle their efficiency the stage leakage the number of processing channels and the impulse response feel all play into which one you want to choose and lastly is experiment if you have a repeating show maybe a summer concert series where you're going to get the same stage eight weekends in a row try different subarrays see if you can get uh, the best feeling one with the number of enclosures that you have my name is michael curtis thanks so much for watching today i'll catch you next time